Um, and the recording just started. Um, uh, I also have everyone muted for now, just because it is a large group and I don't want the system to get overloaded, but feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. Um, we will also be having about half an hour of Q&A after both of our speakers are finished. So if anything comes up for you, feel free to put it into the chat during the Q&A. And we have a couple of moderators who will try and aggregate your questions and comments together so we can kind of feed them back to the speakers. And um, without further ado, uh, let me introduce our two guest speakers today. Uh, with us is Samaya Awad. She's a Palestinian writer and organizer who focuses on Palestine, Islamophobia, immigration, and labor. Samaya is currently director of strategy at the Adala Justice Project and the co-editor of Palestine, a Socialist Introduction. She's a member of NYC DSA and DSA's BDS and Palestine Solidarity National Working Group. We also have Rabbi Alyssa Weiss, who is a community member, ritual leader, grassroots fundraiser, and organizational steward for over two decades. She is the former deputy director at JVP, which is uh, Jewish Voices for Palestine, and co-founder of the JVP Rabbinical Council. Her ideas often appear in multiple anthologies. Oh, <laughs> they do appear in, excuse me, in multiple anthologies, including On Antisemitism, Solidarity, and the Struggle for Justice, and Reclaiming Judaism from Zionism. She graduated from the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College in 2009. Um, so I'm going to let Rabbi Weiss lead us off here and give her presentation, and then we'll get to hear from Samaya. Hey, everybody. Happy Sunday. I'm so happy to be here with you all. Thank you to Philly DSA for inviting me and for organizing this event. Um, I saw some of you, I don't know if any of you here are on the call, but I did run into Philly DSA people yesterday at the Peoplehood Parade in West Philly, which was super fun and was really, and which also had a very strong Palestine contingent, which was also super fun. So um, fun to see you in the streets yesterday in the virtual sphere today. Um, so I want to say um, I, in, in 2012, um, completed a curriculum um, called Facing the Nakba, which I'm going to be using today in um, my presentation. And it was a curriculum that I developed. I'm going to put a link here so you can you can find it. But it's a modular curriculum um, that was designed to teach um, particularly American communities, American Jewish communities originally, but bro more broadly, just American communities about the history of the Nakba. And that's what we're gonna, I'm gonna do in my part of the presentation. Um, and I wanted you to know that that curriculum is available. So if you all ever wanted to go into it more carefully and more deeply and your, if any of you are from other DSA chapters, like that's the available curriculum. Um, and that curriculum was actually based off of an original curriculum from a group, actually a Jewish Israeli group um, in based in Tel Aviv called Zohrot, which works to bring the history of the Nakba into Israeli society. So that is, um, I wanted to just give honor to, to fa the Facing the Nakba crew that I developed this curriculum with and the Zohrot team in Tel Aviv. Um, so one of the reasons why I'm really glad you all are having this event and that it's really important that we start with talking about the history of the Nakba. And if you don't know what that means, I'm gonna to get to it in a minute. Um, is that because a lot of the conversation in the US I think revolves a lot around um, the 1967, right? Um, and um, the occupation of the West Bank, Gaza and East Jerusalem that took place then. But the truth is, is that there's a bigger, that's not the right place to start, right? There's a longer history um, that did like the, the Israeli state was founded in 1948 and the story actually starts before that, of course. Um, and one of the reasons why I think a lot of the conversation actually revolves around 1967 and doesn't kind of take it to the beginning is because I think for a lot of, especially in more liberal circles, there is a desire to focus on this 1960s 67 occupation because of an allegiance to having a Zionist Jewish state because the when you start talking about 1948 you get to a greater moral obligation which is return. Um, so the UN resolution 194 which was passed by in a big majority in December 1948 gave Palestinian refugees the right to return to their homes if they wish to do so. 
And that right has never been materialized. Um, and instead, it's been subsumed in complex diplomatic language <laughs> regarding final negotiations, negotiations that have not happened for now over 70 years. Um, and so to me, it's actually like really critical that our movements, you know, keep pushing Nakba, right? So I said, I started this facing the Nakba curriculum in 2012, right? And here we are in 2021. And it's like the first time that I'm bringing this curriculum to a lot of kind of of the more vanguard, progressive, radical political spaces. So I'm really glad we're doing it and there's a lot to talk about. So I also wanna say as the caveat before getting into it is that I, at, while I think it's really critical that we engage in this history lesson as part of our, um, as of you all building out your campaigning as part of the Palestinian call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions, I think or, or organizing will be more savvy and more strategic knowing this history. I also just want to say that I really believe that you don't need to know the details or the ins and outs of any of this history to know when you see injustice, right? And I know that there's a lot, um, Israel's defenders and Israel itself tries to maintain that it's illegitimate for people who aren't Palestinian or aren't Jewish to have a position on this question. And I think that's wrong, right? So even while I think there's value to doing this, I also wanna say like our tax dollars are funding Palestinian dispossession to the tune of $3.8 billion in military assistance annually. So we need to be raising our voices no matter how fluent we are in the details because injustice is injustice. Okay, so now let's get to the history. So the first piece I wanna ask is, and this is actually something I'm genuinely curious in because this is like a multi-generational space, I think to some extent that we're in right now um, and multicultural space, people from different backgrounds. So there's a core myth that at least I, I was raised in a very traditional Jewish community. Um, and I got this I was taught this myth of, and I want you to, by a show of hands or like in the chat, how many of you heard this or have heard this myth before, which is a land without a people for a people without a land? Had people, did anybody hear that growing up? Some people have heard it a little, yes, okay. So there's this core myth of like a land without a people with it, a people without a land, which is part of what Zionists tried um, like a mantra that Zionists tried to inculcate people with in order to justify um, expulsion of Palestinians. And one thing I actually want to note, which I only recently learned, is that I always heard it and thought of it as like a Jewish Zionist battle cry, but it actually comes from Christian Zionist literature. And I actually think this is really important because I think in general, Christian Zionism gets a pass in, um, in um, being held accountable, particularly in this country for some of the most gruesome policies of support for Palestinian dispossession. And a lot of times it's like, oh, Jewish Zionists control the Israel lobby. And actually that's, oh, the Trump year showed us how untrue, like the, how untrue that really is. Not that that Jewish Zionists don't hold huge amounts of responsibility, but it's also really important that Christian Zionists, particularly white Christian Zionist communities that hold a broader set of right-wing politics be held accountable. So it's actually really important to me to have excavated that truth that like the land without a people myth was a Christian myth. And it was like, a thing that Christians told themselves to justify their support um, for um, a Jewish state, right? And so Balfour, with this past week, we commemorated or whatever, <laughs> I don't know what the right word is, like um, since 1917, the Balfour Declaration, which Balfour was a Lord in the parliament in the UK, and he himself was a Christian Zionist. He was motivated by a desire to have Jews settle in that land so that the second coming would be hastened, right? So, I needed to do that little caveat because once I learned that, I was like, it's my role to make sure that everybody knows that that's not where it comes from. So part of it, and you know, obviously is that part of this mantra of a land without a people is like this justification of disposition and this idea that, you know, Palestinians are not a real people or an identity or a cultural unit. And we hear those, those tropes are still like, you can hear them now from um, all too many members of Congress, right? And um, so it's really important that we challenge that. So I want to offer you, this is one of the pieces from um, the Facing the Nakba curriculum, this precious things from the archive. So this is from, this is a short video. This is from 1896. So 1896 is actually just 
a year before the first World Zionist Congress, where the Jewish Zionist lobby kind of started to make its political case for settlement in Palestine. 15 years later, the cinema is taking its first steps. Cameramen employed by the Lumiere brothers filming at Jerusalem station provide the first moving pictures taken in Palestine. From now on, the camera is a recording eye, and what it records is this. A society much like that of Cairo, Damascus, or Beirut, in an Arab city much like any other. By the end of the 19th century, Palestine has 500,000 inhabitants, of whom 30,000 live in Jerusalem. A veiled woman, a sunny Muslim, one of the majority. An Orthodox Jew, he too turns away from the camera. Here we have an Armenian Pope. Each of the Christian denominations has its church here in the holy city. The holy places of the three religions are scattered across a few hundred square meters. The great mosque is close to Christ's tomb. Further along at the foot of the wailing wall, a Jew is reciting a prayer. He is wearing a Turkish tabush, and though he prays in Hebrew, his everyday language is Arabic. Jews form half the population of Jerusalem, but in the country as a whole, they make up less than 5% of the total. Christians account for 10% and Muslims 85%. subjects of the Sultan of Constantinople. There are no frontiers in the Ottoman Empire. There are administrative divisions in which, in this immense territory, Palestine occupies a mere 27,000 square kilometers made up of three small districts in the south of the province of Damascus. The same empire in the 17th century in the meantime, it has lost the Balkans. France and Italy have seized North Africa. England has moved into Egypt, Aden, and even Kuwait. So that doesn't look like a land without a people to me. <laughs> and I think it's, it's, I like when we found this archival footage from 1896, it felt really important to kind of lift it up and start to see like their you know, the, what they said, 85%, right, of the country were Muslims, 5% were Jews, 10% Christians, right? This was, um, you know, a, a society that was thriving, right? And at the same time, like in 1896, as I said before, right around that time in 1897 was the first World Zionist Congress. And another thing that was happening at that same time, um, which I really like to also excavate from Jewish history was in 1897, the same year as the first World Zionist Congress was the establish of the Labor Bund, um, which was a group of Jews um, who were profoundly influenced by Marxism that kind of were advocating for, you know, workers' rights and a general, like basically the Bund means like a general union of Jewish workers in Lithuania, Poland, and Russia. Um, and that was at the same time. So at this time where like Jews were trying to figure out what to do and how to, how to kind of relate to the powers that be that were so anti-Jewish, their Zionism was one stream and there were other kind of ideas about what to do. But as we know, <laughs> what happened um, in history. Okay, so now I'm gonna take us through just a little bit more detail on, um, on the Nakba. So, um, sorry, here we go. So what is the Nakba? Um, so the Nakba is an Arabic word meaning great disaster or catastrophe. And it refers to the destruction of most Palestinian localities that existed in the area um, that became the state of Israel and the expulsion of most of their Palestinian residents from November, 1947 to July, 1949. And as we'll talk about later, it's really important to say like the, Akba, the Nakba I believe is ongoing, right? But there was this like kind of time period from 1947 to 1949 that's referred to as like the original starting point of the Nakba. So you'll see like um, in these um, photos here on the screen, you could see in the top right um, that this was uh, 
<laughs> settlement of um, a Orthodox um, settlement in a, in a place called Yavna. Um, you can see that on the map on the left side, um, the word Yavna, like it's interesting to me because I actually went to a Jewish day school growing up that was called Yavna um, in honor of this place. And like I, one of my own stories is that I was raised like a very right-wing Zionist. Um, and I personally evolved around this and learning this history and excavating this has been a really important part of my own personal political journey. Um, but just being able to see here how, um, you know, this, this Yavna foundation, the intention of the founders was to make the area near like this ancient town of Yavna that appears in um, the Talmud and in some of the ancient books um, of Jewish history. Um, and what we don't see in this photo is any sign of the nearby Arab village of Yibna, right? So part of the strategy of the Nakba, which I'm going to sh show you here in some photos, is to kind of hide the history of Palestinian settlement in Palestine. Um, and, and there's lots of different ways that that has happened. So when you encounter the Nakba in Israeli society, you encounter it without even being aware of it. So this is a postcard of vacationers on the beach at a park. And in the background is the village of Al-Zib. And a lot of people, when you go visit them, like when my family went to visit Israel when I was a kid, what I was told was those were like ancient Roman ruins, but it's actually a much more contemporary destruction of, of a Palestinian village, like right in the middle of um, Israeli society. Um, so one of the things, like when I started to unlearn Zionism for myself, one of the things that was really kind of the most radical things that I read were actually from Z Jewish Zionist leaders. Um, for example, the minister of defense, um, or the first minister of defense, Moshe Dayan, right? So he writes, he said, Jewish localities were established in place of Arab villages. You don't even know the names of those Arab villages that I don't blame you because those geography texts no longer exist and the books are gone. The Arab villages are also gone, right? And this bragging of replacing, like kind of like taking the names and Hebraicizing them a little bit and literally putting them right on top of the other. So as I said before, you know, this, this slideshow kind of was adapted from the one that Zohrot, the Jewish Israeli organization um, put together because um, their work is to try to like work with Jewish Israelis to see the Nakba in their own community. Um, and by design, right, it's, it's hidden, right? So I just quickly want to go through the numbers just so we could get a sense of it. So in 1947, right, um, the state of Israel was founded in 1948. So this is the beginning of the period that we refer to as the Nakba. There were 600,000 Jews and 900,000, oh, sorry, there's a uh, police going by or something, an ambulance, um, and 900,000 Palestinians. Um, and the number of localities, so like towns, villages, cities, there were different sizes. Um, 350 Jewish ones and around 700 um, Palestinian ones. And this is what happens by 1949. And it's, I mean, it's like every time I look at this, I like get sick, right? Um, of this, dis, you know, discussing mass displacement of Palestinians from Palestine. Um, and the same is true for their locality. So not just the numbers of people, but also their towns. So where there were once 700 towns, there's now 170, right? And then 400, right? Towns or villages or different sized cities. So it's just a mass ethnic cleansing. I mean, there's no other way to describe it. So from 1947 to 1949, 530 Palestinian localities were destroyed and 750,000 Palestinian residents fled or were expelled and not allowed to return. Oh, one thing I want to mention actually in this, and one of the things here, like the reason we use this photo is that one of the things um, that you learn to do when you're trying to like excavate the Nakaba is like, you can see that um, these stone walls were part of the way that Palestinian farmers and agriculture were actually um, kind of had worked the land, right? And now you see that it's overgrown, but in some places when you tour the country, it's like, those are some of the clues that let you know where you are. Um, and actually a quick story, and I tried to find some photos of this for today, but I couldn't find them. And in um, 2007, when I was in rabbinical school, 
um, in the early 2000s. I spent summers in the West Bank doing human rights observation work in Palestinian communities. And one of the things I had the chance to do during that time, this was in like 2006, is take a group of kids from the Janine refugee camp to the villages their families were from before 1948. Um, before kids get turned 16, um, they don't have a huia, like a, an ID card, which would forbid them from going into Israel. So we took kids that were like 12 to 15 on a bus and we took them to the sea for the first time to the Mediterranean. And we took them to the places their families were from so they could see the villages. And I remember one of these set of brothers um, called their grandfather on the phone and like by the position of the sun, as well as some of the rocks that were left, the grandfather was able to direct them directly to where his house used to be in this village. And then told them to look around for a tree where they had carved their names before they fled. Um, and they found it. And it was like, on, you know, I just, even just like remembering it briefly, it like overwhelms me, right? And there is this tether that's still so alive um, in Palestinian society across generations um, to return. And so I personally feel it's really important that we as activists and organizers do all we can to ensure that that happens in the lifetime of people like that grandfather who still could make that trip and return to his ancestral village. So these are some palimpsests um, just to show you kind of this kind of um, this hiddenness, right? So this is a village. So there, what I'm going to show you is, is photos that are around from the 1940s and then photos from the early 2000s. So this was a, a village called Safuria. And this is now the Israeli town of Tsipri. This was um, the Palestinian village, uh, city of Al Musrara. And this is now the Jewish Israeli town of Marasha. This was Ein Karam. And now they call it Ein Karam. Al Lid. And now they call it Lod. And you can see the, the Hebrew, right, on the. Um, on the buildings, right, and and next to the to the to the mosque, right, um, and in one of those one of the other villages, I took those young those kids to on that trip. Um, we went to a town. It wasn't this one. It was a different one, but the mosque had been turned into like an art gallery, right, and this kind of like just like crass desecration, you know, of um, Palestinian religious and spiritual culture. So finally, I, you know, there's this kind of question about like what kind of coexistence existed, right, um, in those early years. So in this bottom photo, um, this was a photo of a ceremony inaugurating um, a Jewish Arab health clinic in Kibbutz Amir in 1945. So this was pre-state. Um, but you'll see, and you can see that on the top of the building, uh, there's a, there's a, banner, and it actually reads in Hebrew, a quote from Jeremiah, which says, behold, I will bring it healing and cure, and I will cure them, and I will reveal to them a greeting of peace and truth. So the photograph describes the realities of living together at this point, right? On the one hand, they're erecting a Jewish Arab clinic to serve all the inhabitants of the area. On the other hand, the sign on the clinic is written only in Hebrew, um, which raises questions about the nature of the cooperation that really existed. Like were, it makes me ask, like were the Arabs partners or only recipients of services from the Jews who constructed the clinic? And what was their kind of idea about coexistence? And then the upper photograph um, is a photo of Palestinian farmers and their Jewish neighbors in the Hula Valley in 1946. This is also pre-state. And though neighborly relations and cooperation developed in many places in the country, the growing strength of um, the two national movements and particularly Zionism meant competition right, um, for resources, which led to tensions and suspicion and violence. Um, you know, there was, but there was evidence of cooperation, right? And um, in the establishment are a number of joint political organizations, professional associations, mixed workplaces and commercial ties. But 
what happened was like as part of the Zionist project, Jewish land purchases led to the expropriation of Palestinian tenants and extended the policy of Jewish labor, right? So they only would hire Jewish laborers. Um, and this original, it was called the Histadrut, the original the Jewish labor union. And so it was really actually around labor that um, the Zionist project was actually, was like kind of met with kind of land grab and control, right? And so, um, you know, these are these complicated history. I just want to lift it up because I think like part of it is when we want to, when we organize, what we're organizing for and what we envision, um, um, you know, for me personally is around, you know, obviously first and foremost, freedom for Palestinians um, and an imagination that there's another way to be and live together. So just to end, this is actually from this past week. Um, I don't know if everyone's been following um, the kind of ongoing Nakba, right? And of in the struggle around Sheikh Jarrah. And, um, you know, this is a statement that was released by the residents of Sheikh Jarrah this week. And you'll see in the final sentence, it says, it is time for our Nakba to end. Um, so rather than thinking of this as just a history lesson, is also to remember that the Nakba is ongoing. And any of our organizing for boycott, divestment, and sanctions um, in solidarity with Palestinians needs to include kind of that analysis and that right that until return, until freedom, until justice, we're not done. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Rabbi Weiss. I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to Samaya next. I also want to remind everyone who's just joining that we have a, a sign-in sheet that Sanwal just reshared in the chat. So make sure to fill that out so we can keep track of who's attending these and who's uh, coming to our events. So uh, Samaya, go right ahead. Thank you. Um, thanks so much, Alyssa, for that foundation and to Philly DSA for organizing this and everyone for being here. I'm going to be a little bit slow because I think I think I'm coming down with a cold. I'm hoping not, knock on wood. But so be patient with me the next 20 minutes. Um, I'm actually gonna start around where Alyssa just left off um, and talk about something that happened very, very recently in the last couple of weeks, which is Israel's decision to label six Palestinian civil society human rights orgs um, as terrorist organizations. Um, in an attempt to clamp down on human rights, on um, the organizations that are crucial, that are really vital to exposing what Israel does um, and in shifting the narrative uh, globally, but I would also say, especially in the United States. And of course, this is just the latest example of you know, repression and these uh, tactics of um, fragmenting Palestinian civil society um, and silencing uh, critics of apartheid and settler colonialism. And I actually wanna um, name some of the organizations because I think it's helpful for us to think about what these orgs are. So I'm gonna name a few. Defense for Children International Palestine, which works to expose human rights violations committed by Israel against Palestinian children um, when they're detained um, in the street, in their homes, etc. cetera. Um, al -Haq, which is a human rights org that's leading the accountability process. Um, basically the process to hold Israel accountable for its war crimes in the International Criminal Court. So of course, Israel wants to label them a terrorist organization, right? Because they're the ones trying to hold Israel accountable for its many, many violations of international law. Um, another is the Union of Palestinian Women's Committees and the Union of Agricultural Work Committees, um, which focus on um, women and labor um, and farmers and the rights of Palestinian farmers and their land. Um, and the last one I'll name is al which is a Palestinian run organization that uh, tracks data on Palestinians imprisoned by Israel, um, including Palestinian children. So these six were labeled terrorist organizations. Um, actually, just today, this morning in Palestine, Israel released um, under military orders, basically released military orders against the six, meaning that Israeli soldiers can now enter the occupied West Bank um, and Gaza um, to detain and close down the offices of these organizations. Um, so that's sort of like the latest thing to happen with that. Now, I, I mention all of this because it goes straight to what Alyssa was talking about, about the Nakba, that it's ongoing, that it hasn't stopped, 
right, that the repression, the violence against Palestinians um, has not stopped for 70 plus years. And so oftentimes the way people talk about Palestine um, in Israel is by saying that this is just something that happened in the past. There were disagreements in the past. Maybe Zionists did some things wrong in the past, but the past is the past. Let's move on. And in fact, what all this points to is that the past is not the past, the past is ongoing, the past is the present. And so when we're talking about the Nakba, when we're talking about Zionism, these are all things that are ongoing, that are unfolding, and then in fact are getting worse, um, which is a lot to say because you know you heard what the Nakba was, it was horrific. Um, and, and the one other thing I'm gonna sort of repeat that, that Alyssa spoke about, but just because I think it's really important to underscore, is how Zionism as, an, as a political ideology is what Israel uses um, as, as ideological cover for its ongoing colonization of Palestine. And actually that's probably one of the reasons why you don't often hear Israel talking about Christian Zionism, right? Because in some ways it works against their whole myth, their whole idea that they're trying to propagate, which is that you can't differentiate between Zionism and Judaism, that they're one and the same. Right, that that's what ties people to Israel. When in fact, as Alyssa said, the largest Zionist organization in the US is actually a Christian Zionist group um, that represents hundreds of thousands of people. Um, and that yes, Trump definitely brought out um, in the last, uh, during the four years he was, he was in office. Um, and in the words of Zionist, uh, the founders of Zionism in Israel, they were very aware of what they were doing. And I think Vladimir Jabotinsky's quote, this is the one I use in every talk I give, where he says, quote, Zionism is a colonizing um, adventure, end quote. And so they, they were under no illusions about the violence it was going to take to take over Palestine, to colonize Palestine. Um, and so it's important to name it. So we dispel the myths and the claims that the struggle for liberation is a religious struggle, that actually it's not. Um, and that's why for many tens of years, there have been um, so many anti-Zionist Jews working against what, what Israel um, what Israel and the Zionist project um, are and stand for. So now that I've said that, um, I wanna move to a little bit of what happened this summer um, and talk about this, um, this ongoing attempt to Judaize, 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 Judaization of the land, of Palestinian land, and specifically of Jerusalem, and the place of Jerusalem and all of this, and why it's come up again and again. And, and we've seen this with Sheikh Jarrah over the summer, and, and now, as, as Alyssa mentioned with the letter, with a statement from the families in Sheikh Jarrah, um, this, this demographic, this attempt to change the demographics of cities in the way that was done in 1948 and that is ongoing is really important because it makes it clear that um, Israel's project by design is to get rid of Palestinians, is to erase Palestinians entirely from the land, their physical presence, but also their identity, that there is no such thing as a Palestinian. Um, that's actually part of the entire uh, project of, sell of settler colonialism um, and of ethnically cleansing the indigenous population. In this case, it's Palestine. Uh, it's Palestinians, but there are many other cases in history where we've seen, where we've seen this happen. And that's important to name because um, it shows that the repression, the clampdown, the really violent attempts to shut down, to isolate, to alienate anyone that dare stand up with Palestine is sort of rooted in that attempt to erase Palestinian identity. Um, and that's why, you know, when there's a BDS campaign on a campus run, you know, that's a few students are, are putting together a BDS campaign, there's a disproportionate response to just a couple of students wanting to talk about Israeli apartheid what we see is the administration clamping down, forcing them to take, um, uh, to you know, to be in mitigated dialogue with um, Zionists on campus, et cetera, et cetera. There's just constantly a disproportionate response, and we see this on a much larger scale in Palestine, like we did in May, when there was the the carpet bombing of Gaza, when Israeli warplanes, uh, many of them made here in the United States, just carpet bombed um, Gaza, uh, entire residential neighborhoods. Um, so this disproportionate response of violence we see on the small scale, like on campuses in the US, to um, on the ground in Palestine, in Gaza, in the West Bank, um, even it, within Israel and Palestinian cities um, within Israel. Um, and despite all of this, right, despite the fact that Israel has been labeled an apartheid state, that there, there's an ongoing case of war crimes in the International Criminal Court, 
despite the fact that so much of this is documented on video, right? The, the killings of Palestinian children, the bombings of Gaza, despite all of this, US funding continues. Um, in fact, increases. During the height of the attacks in May of this year, Biden approved another 735 million in weapons to Israel. Um, and that passed with flying colors. Um, the US actually basically diverts any attempt to hold Israel accountable for its atrocities and war crimes. Um, and continues to supply it with unprecedented military funding packages. Um, in fact, it's more the one that was signed in 2016 was more than the next 10 countries combined. It's a lot of money. Um, and of course, you know, it's no coincidence that Israel is the world's largest arms supplier per capita. And I'll get back to this point in a second. Um, but I, I want to mention two things. The first is, you know, you have to ask a question of like, how do these sales continue? How do they get through what we think is like a complex bureaucracy in the US government to, to have this type of funding get passed? And the reality is that um, there are special exceptions for Israel that are actually built into US law, built into US policy that allowed it, the US to hold Israel to different standards than other partners than other countries that receive funding. And I'm gonna mention a few of these um, sort of exceptions. One is that um, unlike other countries that receive military funding from the US, Israel receives the funding in a lump sum, right? And what that means is it, it decides how it wants to distribute that money, right? And so that means that the US doesn't actually have a mechanism to track where the weapons go, how the money is spent, um, where exactly um, it's, being, it's being used. Um, so that's, that's one. Um, a second is that there are a few countries that have this, and Israel is one of them, is that it's allowed to actually use US funding um, in, in this, like, this foreign military uh, financing to buy directly from US weapons, right? So in fact, there's actually a clause in the agreement between the US and Israel that necessitates, that forces Israel to spend a certain percentage of the money it's getting over here on US made weapons. Um, right, so from manufacturers in the US. And so what this does is it directly boosts the US arms industry. Um, and then you, you have to add a whole other level of business people that are profiting off of this, this weapons trade between the two, between the two countries. Um, and there's absolutely no transparency um, in, in, how this, in how this funding is used, no monitoring whatsoever. Um, so why no pushback? Why is there no pushback against this? Of course, we're seeing pushback now, but in general, you would assume, you know, this is an apartheid state, it's been labeled that. It's constantly in the news when it's when it's bombing and, and exacting violence against Palestinians. So why is there not more of an uproar? Um, and I think that the first thing to say about that is we need to dispel any notion that the reason there's no uproar is because, you know, US support for Israel is about fighting anti-Semitism. But that's actually far from the truth has very little, if anything at all, to do with fighting anti-Semitism. Um, and I think, you know, Israel's relationship, Israel's gov Israel government's relationship with far-right figures and governments around the world um, attests to that. So we know that Netanyahu, but also the incoming government, um, are very close and cozy with um, uh, Modi in India, with Bolsonaro in Brazil, with Viktor Orban in Hungary, um, all of whom um, are very far right figures um, and have shown on many occasions and very publicly um, um, have, have shared, I should say, their, their anti-Semitic views. So it's actually not about fight, fighting anti-Semitism. And in fact, what it is about, and this is kind of rational in some ways, it's about profit and political power and influence. I'm gonna go a little bit into how and why. Um, the, the, there, there are many, many, companies, um, US, uh, US based companies and businessmen, and certainly many of those that are in government that actually are profiting off of the US's continuing uh, relationship with Israel and support for Israel. Um, and to explain this, I actually want to take us to 2010. Um, there, first, I should say this is just one example, and there are many, but I want to take us to this one example, because I think it's important. In 2009, 2010, there was this economic plan that was introduced to, to the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank. And it was dubbed the Palestinian Reform and Development Plan. 
Um, and it was produced uh, with help from the IMF and the World Bank, representatives from the US government, from the UK and France, and of course, from Israel. Um, and the idea behind it was under the guise of, you know, bringing Palestine to the modern world and helping develop its economy, um, that, um, it, that, was, that was how it was sold. And what ended up happening was it actually um, introduced major privatization schemes into the West Bank and elsewhere in the Middle East as well. Um, and it put a lot of power and control with the Palestinian Authority um, with backing from different Gulf countries. Um, it increased cooperation between the Palestinian Authority and um, Israel, um, Israeli, uh, Israeli, Israeli security agencies in particular. Um, and it uh, began what the US was hoping to do in the Middle East, which was it sort of laid a foundation for there to be a single economic zone that ran across the Middle East from Morocco to the Gulf with Israel in the center. And this had reverberating effects across the Middle East. Um, and it came with many other sort of clauses that took place in different places. So there's privatization, um, a lot of subsidies that had existed before uh, for food, for electricity, for water were done away with. Um, I think it was something like 40% of the Palestinian Authority's um, public sector employees um, lost their jobs. Um, and it introduced a much more top down structure within the occupied West Bank um, and also solidify the fragmentation between Gaza and the West Bank. Um, and this is what Israel thrives on, fragmenting Palestinians because the more you fragment them physically, um, the more it has reverberating effects on Palestinian identity, on the ability to organize, on the ability to uh, push back against the occupation um, and, and the many iterations of the occupation that play out. Um, and what ended up happening, sorry, one second, I lost my notes. Um, I, I'm going to just give two examples of, of sort of what, how that transformed different parts of the Middle East and Palestine included. Um, for one, it, it really made it, um, it really ingrained neoliberalism and normalization. Um, so there are different FTA agreements, free trade agreements that were introduced um, in that past. And all the agreements um, were between the US and, and different countries in the Middle East. And what they necessitated, what was read into them was that the country that's signing this free trade agreement um, would uh, commit to normalizing with Israel. In other words, would be forbade from boycotting trade relations with Israel. Um, and before this, many countries refused to work with Israel over the occupation and also because their domestic populations absolutely refused it, right? I mean, there are Palestinians dispersed all across the Middle East. So that was one. Um, and then the other thing, and this is more Palestine specific, is that, like I said, it really fractured national unity in Palestine um, and helped to create a ruling class um, within the occupied West Bank um, that is represented by the Palestinian Authority. And that's actually why over the summer, when we saw huge protests against the Palestinian Authority, that was, a, that was really momentous and important because it, it pushed back on this last decade of the Palestinian Authority being in control and working with Israeli security um, clamping down and repressing uh, Palestinians uh, wanting to organize against um, against the occupation. And I'm happy to answer more questions about this later. I, I tried to condense it into five minutes. But I hope it came across somewhat clearly. Um, but basically this economic reform plan and just like the Oslo Accords as well came in this nice packaging of self-determination, of sovereignty, but in fact did the exact opposite. They entrenched the, the uh, reliance on Israel, reliance on the IMF and the World Bank and the United States. Um, and of course, you, the US profited a lot from this. I mean, you know, there are these um, industrial zones in Palestine, in the West Bank and across the Middle East where US companies like Walmart, um, like Gap, I don't know if Gap is still on the list, but Walmart for sure, where they're able to have these huge factories um, and there's actually absolutely no regulation. There's no laws for how to treat the workers. Um, and this is this is part of these so-called reform plans that, that end up actually just entrenching poverty um, and, and job loss, et cetera. So um, in my last five minutes, if I have five minutes, um, I actually wanna move to talk about what this has to do with us, what this has to do with us as socialists and as DSA. Um, and I think 
I would say that in a lot of what I just said in the last five minutes, I've given you many reasons for why this is important, but I'm, but I'm gonna hone in on three. Um, the first is that organizing around Palestine and around BDS is really, really important and has, and has been proven to be um, in politicizing people, in building class consciousness. And, and workers in the US and oppressed people in the US um, understanding and seeing the connections and the parallels between the struggles we go through here in the US and the struggles of workers beyond our borders. And Palestine is a really good and important example of that for many reasons. But of course, one of the biggest is really understanding how US militarism actually comes back to hurt us here at home too, um, that they can't be separated um, are in fact are directly linked. Um, and also the role of Palestine in politicizing people I think is really important um, and there are so many examples of this, but, but you know, at college campuses, what we see happen on college campuses or in workplaces, when people start talking about Palestine and, you know, very innocently and see the response to that, the really intense pushback, that they start to think, okay, why is there this pushback to me wanting to have a conversation? Um, and it has a, a really deep impact on, on politicizing people and, and, and building class consciousness. Um, the second, and I think this is really important, is it opens up channels um, of, of work and of organizing with Palestinians and Palestine solidarity activists in the US, but also in Palestine and in the Middle East, uh, many of whom are actually increasingly explicitly anti-capitalist. And of course, this is necessary um, and, and really important if we want to build the movement needed to pressure the US government to end funding for Israel, but also if, if our goal is to build a different type of society. Where, um, where we're up against US capital um, and we're transforming that. And if we wanna do this, we have to think about what it's gonna be, what it's gonna take to transform US foreign policy um, and US militarism as it stands. Cause you can't separate that from, from the domestic struggles we're going through. Um, the third um, and, and equally as important is that um, organizing around Palestine really exposes the role of private corporations in government repression. Um, whether it's he, whether it's here domestically or or globally, um, and one example that I'm, I'm sure many of you have heard of, but I'll but I'll repeat it, is Elbit Systems, which is an Israeli company um, that produces a lot of the technology used in checkpoints across the occupied West Bank, and also produces the technology used on the U.S. Mexico border. And so there is a BDS campaign targeting Elbit Systems, um, and and campaigns like this essentially expose these ties. But also any campaign against Elbit systems would affect the construction of surveillance technology on the US-Mexico border, um, at Israeli military checkpoints, um, and, and other places where they're used um, in, in different countries. Um, and this has a, an actual material impact on Israel's ability to reproduce its apartheid regime, right? And it pressures governments and corporations to, to withdraw, to halt their political and financial backing, um, or else you know, risk profit loss, and, and that's what they care about. Um, I'll end by saying that, you know, there is this urgency to the moment that we're in because of the, the shifts in power that we're seeing, because of the narrative shift that we're seeing, where more and more people are open to hearing about Palestine, to understanding the connections between Palestine and struggles here, whether it's racial justice um, or um, uh, environmental justice, and the list is long. And I don't think we're going to have this opportunity for very long because we don't know what's going to happen in the next five to 10 years. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. Thank you especially to Rabbi Weiss and Samaya for being our speakers and tackling many, many questions on this topic. Um, if you got a lot out of this and you're interested in to continue getting involved with uh, Philly DSA and um, our pathway into the BDS work that's already being done in Philadelphia. Um, we are having another event just this Saturday on the 13th called Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions, the BDS movement. Um, if you are just interested in getting to know the DSA chapter more generally, we have a happy hour coming up this on uh, the 12th, this Friday, a new members meeting coming up on the 14th, which is next Sunday, and our general meeting in December um, on the 4th is coming up as well. So thanks again to everyone who attended, submitted questions. Um, I hope you had a great time and learned a lot. And uh, I hope to see you at our next event.